This is TechSnap, episode 414, for October 18th, 2019. Hello and welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting Systems, Network, and Administration Podcast. My name is Wes, and I'm pleased to be joined with Jim, who's freshly back from all things open, all note. Hey, Jim. What's up, Wes? Welcome back. Thanks for joining us today. How was the conference? It was good. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Uh, 5,000 plus attendees, a couple of days. Uh, this was my first conference, like really, truly working as a journalist. So that was kind of nuts. I'm sure that means we'll be looking for lots of good output appearing from you sometime soon. Absolutely. Speaking of which, let's jump into the show today. Since we last talked about low-power, long-range communication devices, there's been some interesting general developments, especially with stuff like Amazon's Sidewalk. And it made me think, what's going on here? And why don't I know more about all of these different protocols and how they actually work? Sounds like you've been doing some more playing with other devices that play in this space, specifically using a technology called LoRa. Yep, absolutely. When I published that article on Ars Technica about the, uh, you know, the SureFi proprietary gear that was intended to bridge HVAC equipment and, uh, you know, remote gates and things like that, a bunch of people popped up in the comments to ask, you know, hey, why didn't you test LoRa? And my first response was, well, you know, I said up the top, I, I tested this thing because their PR guy, you know, got hold of me and shook me by the neck and was like, you should look at this. It's cool. <laughs> and the second answer is because I didn't know LoRa existed until you complained in the comments right now. So when, once I figured all that out, I thought, well, you know, let, let's go see how hard it will be to actually try to implement this. LoRa is a not exactly an acronym. It's sort of a weird abbreviation for long range. Uh, It's a 900 megahertz protocol that uses RF chirp technology, very similar to SureFi. And a lot of Ars Technica readers were convinced that all SureFi really was, was LoRa just, you know, packaged up in a box and called something with an extra price tag on it. So I wasn't honestly quite down to go get a couple of Raspberry Pis and, uh, you know, just get some, some bare LoRa boards and figure out how to hook all that up on the very lowest maker level, but I found a couple of USB devices that would work either on a Pi or just, you know, on a regular uh, Linux computer or laptop. And you could plug these things in and they were pre-built and, uh, you know, had some LEDs on them and uh, their own little antenna. And it was a a gentler introduction into the world of playing with LoRa. And, um, The funny thing about it was it's very difficult to find much in the way of truly concrete information about this stuff. Jumping into it, it felt a lot like, you know, being a a teenager back in the 80s, not to date myself, and, uh, you know, figuring out how to play video games that you'd gotten that were cracked and downloaded from some BBS, and you had absolutely no documentation, and you're just mashing keys on the keyboard and trying to, you know, figure out what happens on the screen with the little guy when you do. Yeah, I noticed the same thing. Now, we... Part of this is, is surely because LoRa is closed source and proprietary, right? I mean, it's there's competing technologies here, things like Sigfox and SureFi, like you played with. And you kind of have to rely on people who've managed to integrate solutions or have just played with the stuff enough that they've bothered to document their personal experience. Even the published papers out there note the same thing. Well, I think the biggest problem with it is, uh, you know, it, it suffers from that really deeply geeky problem where anybody that's talking about it assumes that anybody they're talking to also is like deeply into that thing and already knows about all the things that they're saying. So they just leave a lot of very basic questions completely unanswered. Uh, You know, you can, you actually can find reams of, I, I hesitate to call it documentation, but you know, people talking about things that you can do, but they leave so many things unsaid that you're left. If you're a complete newbie, You're not even sure, like, you know, is there a pairing process between these things? Uh, What does that look like if there is? Uh, Can I have multiple of them on the same space? And you just, you don't find an answer to any of that. And at the end of the day, you kind of have to just give up and buy a few and start playing and see what happens. Right. Because at the end of the day, these are things you are going to have to buy and then try to integrate into whatever components you need to connect. And there's still going to be a lot of work to do, right? I mean, if you're just using base LoRa, all right, you've got devices that can now talk to each other over this robust spread spectrum technology, and that's great. 
but likely you're also still going to need to integrate that with other cloud connected services or even just some through some gateway somewhere so that all that information has somewhere to go. Yeah, it, it kind of depends on what you're looking to do. At the the very base level, LoRa itself, it's kind of funny. So the 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 actual devices that I played with, they're called Low Stick, and you can find them on Amazon. They're not that expensive. They were uh, thirty five or forty dollars a piece, and um, you know they're exactly what it says on the tin. It's a little bitty USB thing. You plug it into a USB on your laptop. Uh, you can use them with Windows, although I didn't attempt to play with that. Of course, you know just Linux all the way for me. Excellent. With current versions of Ubuntu, you don't need to install any drivers. The kernel automatically detects them and you get, uh, you know, TTY USB zero or similar kernel device. So it it basically shows up just like a serial modem, you know, from back in the day. If you ever used dial up modems and you had, you know, the Hayes AT&T commands. Now, these radios take commands in a similar fashion and then pass data in a serial way, just as though you were using a dial up modem. But the actual command set is not the same as it would be for a dial-up modem. You know, I had the question when I first went into that and I couldn't find anything that would really spell it out. I'm like, you know, okay, how do I get two of these devices to talk to one another? And the answer is, if you're all the way down on the base LoRa protocol, uh, there is no pairing. Uh, Anything that's in range will hear and, you know, whatever you're transmitting is going to show up on their TTY USB zero device and you kind of go from there. Uh, low stick prides itself. (laughs) It prides itself on the documentation and example code that it provides. And I will admit it it is more than I saw available anywhere else, but still, you know, you're, you're kind of that kid that's trying to figure out how to play the cracked video game and just mashing on keys and hoping for the best. They provide a little set of utilities that are written in Python and you can use one of them called blinky to just deliberately blink the LEDs on the device. Locally, there's no actual communication involved there, uh, and there there are other there are other little Python apps for sending and receiving, and they're separate. There's also a uh, there's a basic terminal emulator, and if you use the terminal emulator, then you could like for example, you could have a multi user chat over Laura. Um, you would also need to understand the actual command set that goes between the devices to do that. And that was further than I got into it. I just used their simple little, uh, you know, send and receive tools, which basically, <laughs> again, there's there's a distinct lack of documentation for these things. They are fairly simple, but like there's no man page. There's no real like example of how to actually use it on the command line. You basically do a, you know, dot slash send and then feed it the uh, the hardware device name for the the actual lore device. And you do need to do that as root. If you try to do it as a regular user, it will fail and it won't give you a, it won't give you a helpful message. It won't just be like, you know, you can't do this unless you're root. It gives you a really weird message that doesn't give you any good idea of what's going on. <laughs> Sounds like you had some fun there. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was some fun. Fun sucks. Um, it wasn't too bad though. Uh, I'd say I probably spent about an hour, an hour and a half, you know, just kind of farting around with it. Once I figured out that I could make the blinky thing work as long as I used sudo, then uh, that got me most of where I needed to be to figure out the rest. And basically, once you get all this done and you run the send program on one laptop with a LoRa plugged in and you run the receive on another laptop or, you know, you can just plug both of them into a single device with two USBs and run one of them against one of the LoRa USB devices and the other against the other, which is actually how I started out. I was just messing around with it on a desktop machine and had both of the low sticks plugged into two different USB ports. So I had a TTY USB zero and a TTY USB one. And once I'd figured out all the syntax, uh, what it actually does is it sends out a, I think it's like the equivalent of a Mac address for the low stick that's sending plus a, a counter uh, in hex. So you get a whole big string of garbage and then, you know, kind of like a zero, zero, one, and it counts up each time that it sends. And it sends once every, I think it was 10 seconds in, uh, you know, the, the code that shipped with it. And so I played with that and I played with that and uh, the way the code is written, like all you can actually really send using that simple provided program, all you can send is hexadecimal numbers. You can't send arbitrary text, but um, I had trouble parsing 
the actual uh you know count of like how many packets had gone by and what i really wanted i wanted a more frequent send and i wanted to just watch it scrolling on the receiver and i wanted it to be very obvious you know if i missed a few packets because my counter would jump you know more than one as it went by oh yeah so i just you know i got into the code and i found the sleep loop and i cut that down so that it would only so that it would try to send you know once every second rather than once every 10 I really wanted to just like send a text message that was the same every time instead of that, you know, weird Mac address ish thing. Um, but it, you know, it failed out when I tried to send arbitrary text. So I ended up just nerfing that part out completely and sending nothing but the counter, you know, begin, beginning with zero and incrementing one every time. And so that way on the receiving device, I could just see it, you know, go up, you know, zero, one, two, three. And uh, that way I could wander around with the device and I could see, you know, very quickly, when it did drop packets and I could look back over the output and see how many packets it dropped as I moved around with it and, you know, did different things. Wow. Okay. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun and I'm glad you're playing with it because I think these sorts of technologies, things that sort of fill the gap between Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi and existing cellular networks that can connect some of these, you know, low bandwidth needs, the sensors that were rapidly deploying all over our connected world. It's good to know how these work because they're not going away. Speaking of the ubiquitous devices filling our homes, Google has debuted its new Nest Wi-Fi, which is a replacement for the original Google Wi-Fi, right, Jim? I I'm still confused about this whole Nest rebranding, frankly. Everybody's still confused about the whole Nest rebranding. I, I, you know, I, I think the lesson that really should be learned about the Nest rebranding is what it really means is everything is listening, everything is transmitting to the cloud, everything is doing, you know, AI and machine learning processing basing, based on what it sees and hears around it. Uh, that's certainly the big distinguishing factor between the first gen Google Wi-Fi and Nest Wi-Fi. Uh, every Nest Wi-Fi router or Nest Wi-Fi point, which is what they're calling the satellites, uh, they will all have Google Assistant and a smart speaker built right into them. And that's fabulous, you know, if you want a house that's full of smart speakers listening for your every command. But uh, if you're not into that, you're probably going to want to move right past Nest Wi-Fi. All right. Well, if Nest Wi-Fi is not so great, when might I actually want what some of these fancy new mesh technologies? I still, I'm legacy right now, Jim. I've just got one Unify AP at home. And for the most part, it's it's been doing pretty darn well. But I'm getting to the stage in my, in my new place. At the far end, away from the Wi-Fi, it's, it's not quite cutting it. Do I just add a second AP or do I need to explore some of these complicated new technologies like, you know, Nest Wi-Fi or Eero? Well, you know, the, the serious answer to that question is you run a cable to a point, you know, out at the other end of the house. And at the other end of that cable, you drop another UAP. And that's how you get really good Wi-Fi is you got that Ethernet backhaul. Uh, mesh is for people who are unable or unwilling to run any Ethernet cable through the house. And Wi-Fi mesh, you know, ideally what you want is for the mesh to be listening to your devices on one channel and then transmitting from node to node on another channel so that the two don't congest. That wasn't really possible with uh, a lot of the, the, the earlier, the first generation uh, Wi-Fi mesh kits. Google Wi-Fi first gen, I don't know if they ever updated that in any of their, their firmware upgrades, but it was certainly really bad about wanting to both listen on five gigahertz and backhaul on five gigahertz. Now the, the problem with that is, you know, there's this very simple, naive thought that, well, five gigahertz is faster than 2.4, so I want to do everything on five. I don't want to use that slow 2.4 for anything. Right. But the problem is when you've only got one five gigahertz radio and you've got a both front haul and a back haul on the same radio, now your own traffic is congesting with your own traffic and you get not only half the throughput, not even half the throughput, you really get about 40% the throughput ideally, but it's also really, really weird and bursty and you have some really bad latency issues when you're heavily using the Wi-Fi. Nobody wants that. No, I'm imagining a uh, crowded room of people talking to each other and it's hard to make out anything in there. So ideally with mesh Wi-Fi, uh, you know, what you want is you want a kit, if possible, you really want tri-band, not just dual band, so that uh, you can talk to your 2.4 gig devices uh, on the front hall, and you can also talk to your five gigahertz devices on front hall and use another five gigahertz channel to backhaul to the next node out. 
that's how you really get your your more predictable uh, lower latency connections. And you know, when I test these things, I do test the throughput, but I don't care too much about it, to be honest. The latency is what really upsets you when you're actually using these things. Not sitting there staring at a speed test, but, you know, actually trying to browse browse social media, look things up on Wikipedia, you know, whatever it is you're doing, even, you know, playing games on your phone, latency is the thing that you really notice. When you click the the button or, you know, you tap the icon or you do whatever and nothing happens for a while and you're just staring at your device and wondering, should I hit refresh? That's the thing that you want to avoid and that's latency. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, I'll go drag out the ethernet cable I've got buried in a box somewhere. Now, the other argument to be made for consumer mesh is that it is consumer focused. I mean, you know, Ubiquity gear, it's not that hard to set up. If you're a sysadmin, it shouldn't be very scary at all. You can install the controller on either a Windows, Mac or, uh, you know, Linux machine or VM. You know, it, it is a service that you own at that point. Uh, you do need to actually back that service up in its configuration. Otherwise, you know, if you if you lose it and then you want to be able to reconfigure your Wi-Fi network or add an access point or whatever, you have to start all over from scratch again if you've lost the controller. Now, a lot of people don't realize about this stuff is it continues working just fine, even with the controller offline. The only feature that actually requires the controller to be online is if you've set up a captive portal, you know, where people have to click OK to like, you know, terms of service when they join your guest Wi-Fi or something like that. That will break if the controller is not online. Oh, right. You're going to need a web server stuff run in there. Yeah, but everything else works. Even if you've got uh, multiple access points, like, you know, I've got, I think I'm up to six in my house now. Um, if you turn the controller off, roaming still works just as well as it ever did. Uh, none of those things require the controller. The only thing you need the controller for is reconfiguration, you know, like changing a name or changing what channel it operates on. Or, you know, just kind of seeing what's connected to the network, uh, you know, maybe kicking people off because that's hilarious and you're a bully, um, you know, or adding new access points, that kind of thing. That's when you need the controller. The bad thing about that is because you most people will feel like they actually need the controller so infrequently. If your sysadmin foo isn't up to snuff, you're liable to lose it at some point and just never notice and never bother because you don't use it all the time. So you kind of don't care. But, you know, then a year later, you want to add a new access point or you want to change the Wi-Fi name or change the password. And you realize, oh, crap, I can't do it. And now I have to set everything up from scratch. I have to paperclip reset all my UAPs, rejoin them to a new network. It's a pain in the butt. Yeah, that's definitely uh, never happened to me. It, it hasn't happened to you yet, but uh, I will mention also, you know, given that you've only got one access point right now and you're only thinking about going to two, there is a pretty neat option that kind of, uh, you know, dives right down the middle between the UAP requiring controllers and consumer mesh kits that, you know, they have easy to use, uh, you know, apps and smartphones. Right. The better of them will have, you know, web interfaces. I certainly always want my web interface if I can have one. Unfortunately, the industry is moving away from them. but if neither one of those sounds like it's quite right for you, if you like the idea of a web interface and you don't like the idea of having to keep up with a controller and you only have, you know, one or two or three maybe access points, you could ditch the UAPs and you could instead go with TP-Link EAP access points. Uh, believe it or not, they actually outperform the UAPs in my testing. Now, don't get me wrong. The UAPs are great. My house is packed chock full of UAPs and I'm not rushing out to tear them down and replace them. But when I tested all the access points I could get on the market that were, you know, aimed at the small business or lower segment, the absolute top performer was TP-Link's EAP-225. And those, while they do also offer a controller interface that's a lot like the, the Unify controller and much like Unify, it can be installed on Windows or on Linux, um, it's not necessary. You can also run the individual access points in a standalone mode. You can browse into their web interface just like you would with a consumer router and just configure them to be on the same SSID. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, the roaming is still every bit as, it, as good as it would be with the controller. Uh, you just you just don't have the single point of control anymore. Rather than have a single web interface to manage all of them, you have a separate one with each individual one. But you don't have to run that controller. You don't have to back up that controller. And unlike the Unifies, Ubiquity did a couple of years ago, they did add a mode where you can run a UAP in a standalone mode, but it is just profoundly handicapped if you do that. If you run a UAP in single access mode, the only thing you can do is set a single SSID, 
no guest SSID, no multiple SSIDs, no VLANs, uh, you know, no anything. Wow. Just here is an SSID and that's it. You can't monitor who's on it. You can't change the channels. I mean, it's just, it's dumber than any consumer Wi-Fi access point or router I have ever seen, which is saying a lot. The uh, TP-Link EAPs, although they have a controller software and it works great, um, they also have this individual standalone mode and everything works in the standalone mode and you get all the features that you would have in the controller. The only downside is, you know, needing to browse into each one of your access points, IP addresses. If you want to, for example, you know, change the Wi-Fi password, but if you only got two or three of these things in a fairly simple setup, you know, maybe you just got one or two SSIDs and maybe a guest SSID, it's not that big of an ask and there's nothing else to keep up with. It just works. You don't need an app. You don't need a controller. Just browse into the IP address and go. Well, this week, the thing that's been putting stress on my Wi-Fi network has been the daily ISOs of Ubuntu 1910. I've been playing with it really all week in preparation for talking about it on Linux Unplugged, so go check out the latest Linux Unplugged if you want to see our take on the latest release. I saw you've been doing some playing, too, and, of course, because it's you... You've been looking at the new experimental ZFS install option. Yeah, Wes, when I saw Popey tweeted out that the uh, experimental installer was available in the daily build, I went immediately right to the the, uh, the download page and got the uh, October 9th daily, downloaded that, and started playing with it in a VM. Uh, it works pretty well. Yeah, I'm running some benchmarks on, on my ZFS installation right now, and so far, no complaints. For people who haven't been following things as closely, though, why is this a big deal? I mean, Ubuntu's had ZFS support for a long time, right? Yeah, it has, and it's been great for a long time. But, uh, you know, a lot of folks have asked rather urgently for uh, direct support of ZFS on root. I kind of bypassed the issue of not being able to install Ubuntu on a ZFS root by just not doing much of anything that I care about, you know, on the bare metal. I do my really important tasks on virtual machines. They're on ZFS data sets, and that allows me to snapshot them and replicate them and run them, you know, individually on arbitrary machines and all that good stuff. And so I just stopped caring about the host. You know, the host is something that I can install from a USB stick in 15 minutes and have to the condition it needs to be to run my VMs, and, you know, then I'm good to go. But a lot of folks are like, well, you know, I want ZFS on my desktop machine, and, uh, you know, I want to be able to recover from... If you've ever faced a, uh, a really ugly dependency loop with apt... Maybe you tried to install somebody's package from a PPA and it wasn't really quite as well put together as it could have been. And then you go to remove it, but it uh, it won't let you remove that package because it says another package depends on it. And it won't let you depend, remove the other one because that depends on something else. No matter what you do, you just you can't get into a good condition and you fight it for hours and hours. And, uh, you know, in a worst case, maybe you end up just giving up and backing up your home directory and reinstalling the whole machine. Right. I mean, you're admitting defeat there, right? You're you're saying, oh, no, that update went so poorly, I have to reinstall. And for as robust as our systems are, it makes everything feel a bit outdated. Yeah. And, you know, the the, the most common time I've seen that happen is doing a, uh, you know, a major version upgrade. Like you want to go from 1804 to 1904 or 1904 to 1910, you know, something like that. And something goes just really kind of screwy. The do release upgrade itself usually works okay. But then maybe when you go to reinstall some packages that got uninstalled during the process, uh, it only uninstalled some of it and not all of it. And now you're left with a weird collection of pieces and parts. You're not quite sure where they all are, and it just doesn't want to go away cleanly. Um, having a ZFS root allows you to bypass that whole problem to a degree by just taking a snapshot before you do something that might go south. And then, you know, say you go to do an apt remove or an apt dist upgrade or what have you, and it gets into one of these nasty dependency loops or it loses you an important package. Like it, maybe it's not even a, a package that would necessarily be impossible to reinstall, but you know, maybe you just weren't paying attention and it removed the Ubuntu desktop meta package. And then you said apt auto remove and it pulled out every single visual package on your system. You're like, 
oh, well, you know, there goes my next 40 minutes while I wait for all this stuff <laughs> to reinstall. Yes. If you've got ZFS on root, you have a better option. Assuming you took a snapshot first before you made that disastrous apt auto remove command. Instead, you can just say ZFS rollback, uh, you know, our pool at snapshot. And uh, it will instantly roll everything back to the condition that it was in before. Now, I will say if you're doing this on a live mounted root file system, although it will work, things are going to be kind of weird because you're going to orphan a bunch of file handles. So you need to reboot immediately after that. But once you reboot, everything's just like, you know, your nasty mistake never happened. And rather than fighting it for 40 minutes, you can just do a rollback in three or four seconds and reboot in another 10 seconds and you're done with it. Wow, that is fancy. Now, are you going to get that? If you go and try out this experimental feature today? Well, you'll get the ability to do it. Uh, it. What you will get is you'll get a ZFS boot pool and a ZFS root pool. And you'll absolutely have the ability to snapshot that and roll back to it if you do something ugly that you regret. What you're not going to have is any automatic integration of snapshotting, you know, like into the apt package manager itself. If you forgot to ZFS snapshot everything that you cared about before you did the apt auto remove or apt install or apt, you know, whatever, then there won't be a snapshot there to roll back to in the first place. Uh, there's also nothing in place yet to take just regular scheduled snapshots. Uh, you'll need some kind of orchestration tool like my own Sanoid that can be configured to automatically take snapshots and expire them you know, according to schedule and policy if you want that facility. If all you do is just install 1910 and use the experimental ZFS installer, well, then you'll have ZFS, but you won't have any snapshots, so you can't do any rollbacks. Right. It just sort of makes things a little simpler if you, so you don't have to install things and then reinstall them to get it set up just how you want. Now you can use Ubiquity and have ZFS. Although we should note right now, you can't do it alongside another installation and there's no customization options. You just have to give it all the disk and uh, trust. Yeah, and that also means that you don't have the option for uh, you know more complex setups. You're basically going to get you know a laptop style install out of this. It's going to be a single disk. It's going to use the whole disk. It's going to carve it up the way that it wants it. If you were wanting, you know, to end up with a, you know, mirrored or maybe even a RAID Z root pool, uh, you can't get that out of the installer. Now you can get that later on by just, you know, adding devices to the pool, but yeah, it, it takes a little surgery and a little know-how. Now the other big thing I think that you get out of this, you know, it was possible to set up Ubuntu booting on a ZFS root prior to all this. The big thing that I think that you get aside from the ease of using the Ubiquity installer, there's the insurance of knowing that Canonical takes this seriously as a feature now. Even though it does still say experimental for the time being, you know that the maker of your distro is saying, this is an option that we support. Uh, we do care about it. If we make some upgrade that breaks people that are booting to ZFS, that's a bug. And we're going to we're gonna do our best to avoid that in the first place and fix it as rapidly as possible if it happens anyway. That's important. Yeah, that is signs of good things to come, I think. Now, if you're going to use it right now, they say, well, probably don't use it in production unless you're willing to tolerate some problems and potential debugging. And they may change how some of the things are laid out before we get to the upcoming 2004 LTS. I'm really excited for this development because it seems like Canonical's got some, some high aims. Other operating systems that have had, you know, longer ZFS integration and systems like OpenSUSE with their embracing of ButterFS, well, they've got some of the deep hooks you were talking about, snapshots on package changes or things like boot environments where after a big update, you've got some confidence that the system can automatically roll back to the last known good state. Now, we don't have that yet, but Canonical's also been working on a daemon to help with some of this by the name of ZSYS. Some of the goals, they say, are things like running multiple ZFS systems in parallel on the same machine, automated snapshots, managing complex ZFS dataset layouts, and managing complex ZFS layouts, separating user data from system and persistent data. I could also imagine complicated backup setups here, you know, taking advantage of some of these automatic snapshots and replicating them to other servers. Now, to be clear, Wes, we don't have ZSYS yet, but we've already got the, the complex layout. When you, when you do a default install with 1910 and you use the experimental ZFS installer, you only get the two pools that I mentioned, but our pool is split into a bewildering array of separate data sets. You've got one for VAR, one for lib, one for varlib account services. You've got one for home. You've got one for 
your directory under home, you've got one for user, you've got one for several directories under user, several under et cetera. I mean, there's there's more than a page of data sets, you know, in your console when you do a simple ZFS list. Now, the good thing about carving everything up so finely like that is it means that you you already can do one of the things that you alluded to. You can make the decision to roll back the rest of the system without rolling back your home directory. So, you know, documents that you've created don't have to go back in time when you remove, you know, when you pull your system's packages back in time. And that is cool. But the problem with it is that most users are going to have no idea of when you would want to roll back var lib account services without rolling back user or vice versa. And even when you do know exactly what you want to do, now you have a whole lot of individual commands. You have to do them all and get them all right to roll back the right data sets and not roll back the wrong data sets. One of Zsys's aims is to make a, uh, a user interface that's a lot simpler to manipulate where you can give it a more human goal of, I wanna roll back my packages and not affect my logs or not affect my user data and have Zsys handle all the individual commands for you. Oh, I like it. And you also alluded to boot environments. Uh, that's an important one. And that's one that fr- longtime FreeBSD veterans have particularly asked about. Over in the BSD world where they've been uh, you know, booting to ZFS root for years and years now, they have complex boot environments that look kind of like, you know, what we're used to with grub menus. You know, you install a new kernel and grub automatically adds that kernel to the list in the grub menu. And if you press escape while you're booting or hold left shift or whatever, you know, you get the whole menu and you can say, well, I want to boot into the 4.13 kernel or I want to boot into the 4.18 kernel or I want to boot into the new shiny 5.3 kernel. It's kind of like that, except instead of only booting into a different kernel version, you can literally boot an entire different root system based on these snapshots. Let's say that you take a snapshot before you do a big apt upgrade operation. Maybe that apt upgrade operation is not even just an apt upgrade. Maybe it's a do release upgrade. And after you get done with that thing, you're no longer going to be on 1910. You're going to be on 2004. So that's pretty scary, right? And maybe you do that operation. You take your snapshot first because you're cautious. And, uh, or maybe by then, you know, we already have the snapshotting built in automatically into apt or do release upgrade. That'd be nice, right? It sure would. Well, anyway, you do this and you boot into 2004 and it's not quite ready for you yet. You know, I mean, it booted, that's okay. And you can see what's going on, but not all your applications are installed and you can tell you're going to have some work to get comfortable in this thing. And it's not a good time for that. You really hope that everything was just going to boot and be fine. And you don't have a couple of hours to spend messing around with it. You just want to go back to 1910. That's one of the design goals for Zsys is to give you the ability to quickly and easily do exactly that. Reboot and pick your pre-upgrade snapshot from the boot menu and boot right back in to 1910. Oh boy, the future is going to be great. All those advanced features, they sound wonderful, but before it's all automated, what does a ZFS newcomer need to know? You know, they they have the time, they're going to start playing with this technology before it becomes more prominent. What do you need to know about managing ZFS? Well, that's a really deep topic. I I think, you know, not even so much about managing ZFS as uh, just a little bit of conceptual understanding. When we talk about these snapshots, if you're not used to this technology, it's really easy to misunderstand what it is and what it does. Uh, Snapshots are block level. So it's not per individual file. And when you take a snapshot, you don't actually have to write any new data to the system at all. All it really does is makes all the blocks in their current condition immutable and attached to that snapshot name. Blocks can belong to multiple snapshots. And as long as any block on your disk drive or SSD belongs to one or more snapshots, including the live current version of the file system, it can't actually be deleted. If you say, I want to delete that, the file system says, okay, but really it just removes it from the current version of the file system. And it's still right there in the snapshot where you left it. So, As time goes on and you delete things that belong to a snapshot in the current file system, or you add more data in the current file system that wasn't in the snapshot, now you see the snapshot diverging and it takes up the amount of space that it diverges from the current file system. But that usually doesn't add up to a whole heck of a lot. So, you know, even if your disk is, let's say, 60% full, you can actually very easily have 50, 100, even 200 snapshots of your file system 
and still not be any more than, you know, 60 or 70 percent full because they're not actually taking up that much extra space per individual snapshot. Now, the only way you actually get the space back that those snapshots consume is by removing those snapshots. Like I said, uh, as long as a block is owned by any snapshot, it's immutable and won't actually be deleted and marked free. But once you remove the last snapshot that points to it, then that block becomes free again. Right. So if you have a snapshot on your system that has, say, a gig worth of data that you've deleted from the rest of the system and it's not in any other snapshots, When you ZFS destroy that snap, then that 10 gigs becomes free for use again. And all of that magic is uh, made possible by the copy on write nature of ZFS, right? I mean, you're not, you know, you're not overriding these blocks in place. Absolutely. That, that is, you're, you're very right, Wes. That's the, that's the key underlying feature that's necessary for this to happen. Uh, in a normal file system like ext4 or NTFS, when you tell the file system, hey, that block right there, I want to change what's in that block. It does exactly what you ask it to. It goes to that specific block and it changes the value in it. When you tell ZFS or another copy on write file system, such as Butter, when you say, hey, I want to alter the contents of that block right there, the file system says, sure, I'll do that, but it's lying to you. What it's really doing is it's writing to another free block, the contents of you know your modified set of data, and it just changes the link in the file system from the old one to the new one. Now, if there are no snapshots that reference that old block, it also unlinks the old block once it gets done with that operation. But if there was a snapshot that referenced it, then it's still linked in that snapshot, so it's never marked free. For those new to snapshots, they may also need to know that While snapshots are useful for backups, they are not a backup. Yes, that is very true. A snapshot is not a backup. To be fair, you know, many times a backup is also not a snapshot. If you really want your data safe, you you need both. You need snapshots and you need a true backup. A true backup is another copy of your data on another device, preferably on a whole other system. And ideally, you know, you want to have a you want to have a fairly deep tree of snapshots on both your source device and your backup device. But the reason that a snapshot is not a backup is it doesn't protect from all the factors that can destroy your data. A snapshot, if you have one, is a great hedge against, you know, an accidental user RMs the wrong directory and now it's gone. Well, if it's still in the snapshot, then you can either roll back to that snapshot or you can just mount the snapshot and cherry pick that data back out of it and you're fine. So it did protect from some forms of user error but it can't protect from all forms of user error. For example, if your user has root access and your user destroys the snapshot, (laughs) well, the snapshot's gone. Another issue is that should you have unrecoverable on-disk corruption or degradation, now that's something that ZFS fights very hard against, but should it actually happen, should a block on your system get corrupt on storage and you don't have a good copy of it in parity or redundancy, It doesn't matter how many snapshots you had, all those snapshots are still just referencing that one block. So you might say, well, I have this file in my current file system, and I also have it in yesterday's snapshot, and I have it in 24 hours worth of daily snapshots, and I have it in two monthly snapshots, but there's still only one actual copy of it. It's just referenced from a bunch of places. Now, I do also want to clarify, Wes, I said that a a snapshot is not a backup, but to be fair, a backup is also not necessarily a snapshot. What I was really getting at there is that one thing that traditional backups are notoriously poor for is protecting against corrupt data. If data gets corrupt on disk and you have a typical backup routine where, you know, maybe you have what for a conventional world is a fairly deep backup set. Maybe you keep seven dailies, maybe you keep 30 dailies and you back up your system to 30 different tapes once a day. Um, unfortunately, if data gets corrupt in a file that you don't use all that frequently, it's very easy to end up overwriting all of your backups with a corrupt version of that file before anybody notices that it's corrupt and bad. And if that happens, it's just gone for good. So conventional backup schemes aren't very good at helping us with that. They don't really detect changes in the files very well. They certainly don't know the difference between a valid change and corruption. Now, the difference is if you're using ZFS, ZFS stores a checksum of every single block along with the contents of the block itself. And whenever you read a block in ZFS, it checks the data versus that checksum, which is a, uh, that's a cryptographic checksum that is, it has a very low probability of collision. Um, As a matter of fact, the default checksum scheme in ZFS is Fletcher 4, and it has a, a hash collision probability of 1 in 2 to the 77th 
which is enormous if you're not used to scientific notification. You would, I mean, I've literally had machines with millions of checksum errors and no lost data because there were no hash collisions. The system knew what was going on and it just kept recovering the data from parity or redundancy. Right. Now, if you've got parity or redundancy, meaning, you know, a striped array with a disk worth of parity, or maybe you're using mirrors like I prefer, what happens is when ZFS reads that block and it sees that it's corrupt, then it goes to get the, the copy of the exact same block, either from a redundant disk or by rebuilding it from parity for the whole stripe. It checks that versus its checksum. And assuming that matches, it knows it's got a good copy. It overwrites your original corrupt copy. And you're just off to the races. You have no corruption. You're good to go. That's the thing that your traditional backup routine won't do for you. Now, one important piece of that puzzle is that in addition to just reading your files when you read them, you really should be doing regular scrubs. A scrub is very simply reading every single block in your storage that should have data in it and comparing each one of those blocks data to its checksum and then, you know, repairing it or just notifying you if there is no way to repair it when it finds it. Now, the good news is Ubuntu for several years now, by default, uh, it creates a cron job for you that scrubs any pools in the system on the first Sunday of every month. Oh, that's just so handy, right? And then it can go and make sure that everything is what it should be. That does sound like a property I might want on my root file system if I'm particularly concerned about the operation of that machine. Absolutely. Now, what I've done for years is I've just made my home directory a ZFS data set. So, you know, my personal workstations, they don't boot onto a ZFS root, but um, the the system is done with booting well enough that by the time it wants to mount your home directory, it's capable of mounting ZFS stuff just fine. So by the time you log in, your home directory is available and everything actually works great. Doing the ZFS root, that's what allows you to actually roll back screw ups in the underlying system with the package manager. That's what I can't do on my older workstations that don't have a ZFS root. Well, then I think I better go start taking some snapshots right away. That's going to do it for this episode. But if, like us, you've been playing with Ubuntu 1910 or just playing with ZFS, do let us know techsnap.systems slash contact. Of course, over at techsnap.systems, you can find our whole back catalog. If that's not enough for you, jupiterbroadcasting.com has the whole selection of fine network programs, including the recently launched Linux headlines, all the Linux and open source and cloud news you need in three minutes or less. Still want some more? Well, come talk with Jim and I. We're both on Twitter. I'm at Wes Payne and Jim, you're at JRSSNet. The network's there too, at Jupiter Signal. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, everybody.